Thank you very much, Samira. Um, good evening, everybody. Nice to see so many people. Um, I'm not surprised, not because immodestly I think you're all here to hear me, but I know you've all got brains, um, you've all got genders of some kind, um, and even a gender agenda of some kind, and everybody I know, having talked about this quite a lot, has an opinion, um, and I'm sure you're here to share that with us. So I get the wonderful opportunity to give you my opinions for the next hour, and then after that, hopefully, we'll get lots of questions. So moving on as quickly as I can, um, as Samira mentioned, I'm at the Aston Brain Centre, and we're really fortunate there that we have the full range of brain imaging techniques, which I have access to, and that allows me to um, actually produce some wonderful images, images which will show us um, where the brain is active, um, structures, pathways in the brain. We can look at brain structures, brain functions. They're wonderful pictures. I'm really proud of them. But we will see that they should be part of the solution of the issues we're going to be talking about tonight, but actually they can be part of the problem. Now, before we start, before um, I lull you all to sleep, I'm going to teach you a bit of statistics. Now, forgive me if actually you're all very sophisticated statisticians, uh, which would be slightly worrying for me. But the thing is that we're going to be talking about differences. This is why people are here. They're thinking there's a difference between men and women. People like me stand up and say, actually, no, there's not. Very puzzling for people. But what we really need to understand here is what we mean by differences. Now, not to go into a lot of statistical detail, but what we're really interested in is whether you take two groups of people, how different are they? If you take uh, different measures from them, do you get overlapping um, distributions like we have at the top, where clearly members from one group are very different from members of the other group? But even if you look um, two groups of people who are different on a on a score that you think actually distinguishes them quite clearly, if you look at, at this kind of distribution here, you'll see there's quite a big overlap. That's actually a measure of height in men and women. Now, people will always say, well, of course, me all men are taller than women. And, you know, there, maybe there's a few shorter men and a few taller women, but they're really quite different. But actually, that's the size of the difference. So you might get a difference here, what we call the means, the averages are different. So when people say, on average, men are taller than women, they're right. But there's a big overlap here. And the reason I'm giving you this now is that actually most of the differences we're going to be talking about in cognitive skills, in brain sizes, brain functions, the whole range of issues which are associated with men's and women's brains are really of this kind of order. We're looking at tiny, tiny differences. And this difference here is called an effect size. So effect size is really quite important. So if you hang on to that thought, it'll be a thread which will hopefully go through what I'm going to be talking about. And there may be a test at the end. OK, right, so moving on swiftly, because there's so much exciting stuff to talk about. Um, way back in, in 1673, um, de la Barre actually said, made the wonderful st statement, the mind has no sex. Now, um, Samira mentioned uh, a book that it's worth reading, so you're going to go away with a reading list today as well, because there's a wonderful book uh, by Londa Scheibinger called The Mind Has No Sex, which actually looks at effectively how women disappeared from science um, and their biology and their biologi biological uh, inabilities were, were used to kind of write them out of science. But she called the book The Mind Has No Sex because that's what Labar said way back in, 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 as I say, in, in 1673. And he'd said, looking at the new, he was a new uh, philosopher, um, became very interested in the new science of anatomy, and he eventually concluded that having looked at all of the structures and functions which seemed to be important for high levels of achievement, he felt that there was really no differences between men and women. He felt that there was no reason why, given the right opportunities, women shouldn't be successful as men. So way back in 1673, now... If people had listened to him, we could stop now, and this would be the shortest his, uh, lecture in the history of the Royal Institution. You might all want your money back. But obviously, people didn't listen, and what's been going on since then is actually trying to contradict his, his conclusion. So let's have a look. What I, the title of the talk is How Neuro Nonsense Joins Psychobabble to Keep Women in Their Place. So really, to give a historical context, what do we, we mean by women's place? <laughs> 
Well, right at the very beginning when people were looking for differences, as you can see from these wonderful quotes, um, women's place was very much down the pecking order. The idea was that women were inferior. And new scientists and new neurologists, etc., were saying, this is the given, women are inferior, and we need to demonstrate why they're inferior, why they um, you know, don't achieve as, as, as much as we do. And so there is a range of quotes, there's a range of people supported this. Um, some of my scientific heroes, unfortunately, believe very strongly in women's inferiority and science's role in proving that. Darwin was one, Broca was another, a great brain scientist, but was really into the science of craniometry, where you're measuring skulls and drawing conclusions about people. Um, and but perhaps the most interesting quote, um, one that we might bear in mind, is from Le Bon, who says, you know, clearly there is no argument that women are inferior to men. And he, he railed on at some length and said there may be some examples, uh, exceptions, but they were a bit like a gorilla with two heads. So exceptional women are gorillas with two heads in his particular thinking. So this is what we were trying to prove. And the idea was that biology is destiny. It's, you know, whatever women would like to do, whatever we feel is right or wrong, their brains are different from men's. This is part of their essence, what we call essentialism. So we really shouldn't be going against it. And we're talking about the natural order of things. So there was a lot of belief that if you took a brain, um, a pink brain and a blue brain, appropriately colored, they were different from birth, you got this kind of change um, as, the, as the brain grew, but eventually you got this kind of pink marshmallowy type brain, which really wasn't good at very much. Whereas on the other hand, the blue brain became armored um, and grew and strengthened and could become a captain of industry, or its owner could become a captain of industry, etc. But the key thing is um, that these were real differences. They weren't constructed. This was, this was what biology gave us. And that was a really strong belief. So that's the 18th century. The 19th century, slight shift in that it wasn't just that women were inferior. There was a bit of attention to the fact that they were reproductive capacity is very important, that they were slightly fragile, that even though they might like to do the same sort of things as men, um, they really shouldn't. And so if educational opportunities were made available to them, this was actually not a very good idea. Um, their ovaries would shrivel. Um, they would no longer be able to run a household, etc. end of civilization as we know it. Swiftly move on to the 20th century. We were still looking then um, at women's, the different uh, roles that women could play, women's place. But in this case, it was much more to do with the, the roles that they might play. So that we'd moved just from saying they're inferior to saying they do have particular roles. So the stereotype had kind of shifted from being prescriptive, you are inferior, to proscriptive, these are the things that you should do. Um, and given the century, there was quite a lot of, of reference to what I have call, um, sorry, psychobabble, which is really um, looking at, you know, we must start with the realization that as much as women want to be um, good scientists or engineers, they want first and foremost to be womanly companions of men and to be mothers. So there was a clear message in the 20th century that women had a particular role and they should fulfill that role. And that was based on their, their biology. And, and in order to um, fulfill that biology, they shouldn't stray uh, from any particular path. Big argument of the 20th century, which is very much biology versus society. And in the end of the sort of 1970s, with what I call the first wave of feminism, so a bit like we've had the first wave of neuro-nonsense from people like Le Bon, here we've got people saying, this is actually not right. Society is prescribing these particular roles, and they're using biology to make sure that those roles, which were currently inferior, um, are what women fulfill and keeps them in their place. So there's big arguments along those lines. And there was quite a lot of um, uh, reference to hormones. Hormones were actually much more interesting at that time than, than brains. They had much more access. You could measure hormones. You could infer what was going on hormonally. So you get these wonderful descriptions, you know, PMS, be afraid, um, all about, you know, the trouble with women. They do have problems with these raging hormones. You've got uh, scientific assessments, the menstrual distress questionnaire, you know, talk about loading uh, the data that you're collecting. I've never come across an ovulation euphoria questionnaire, for example. <laughs> 
So really what the idea was, and there was you know, references uh, in the popular press, um, Bay of Pigs uh, disaster, which people, some people may be familiar with. There was actually a statement in the press, wasn't it lucky, that there wasn't a woman in charge at the time, because if she'd been subject to raging hormones, you know, who knows what would have happened. You know, the men in charge having done such a cracking job of it anyway, of course. But um, <laughs> Anyway, so... Let's quickly move on to the brain, because I think that's why you're here, a lot of you. At the end of the 20th century, one of the things that people started looking at was the idea that there was some kind of fixed organisation in the brain, that different bits of the brain did different things, which, of course, is a echoing back to the old kind of phrenology idea. So it's a sort of neo-phrenology. But there was um, a, an interest in the fact that you know, the left hemisphere was logical, the right hemisphere was creative, suggesting that the right hemisphere was female, the left hemisphere was male, being superior, um, logical, etc. Also, these kind of data started emerging, which started people getting really interested. This is a picture of um, male brain, female brain, or a group of, of males and females uh, carrying out a language task. One of the things reported was actually um, in the way it's configured at that time. That's the left hemisphere. Um, big emphasis on left hemisphere activity in the male brain, whereas bilateral activity in the female. Now, this is an example of the kind of genuine, genuine at the time finding, which has actually captivated the imagination of people we'll be coming to talk about shortly, particular authors who grab onto ideas that really look to see how current they are or how well this research is carried out. But this was immediately adopted in saying, oh, you know, men are logical, they use their left brains, they're the ones who can really uh, put forward a, a clear logical argument, whereas women use both sides of the brain, so their emotional side is more in touch with their logical side, etc. Now, I did actually check this morning. Um, this paper, sorry, this paper has been cited... Uh, over 1,400 times. It was published in 1995. It's actually wrong, um, not been replicated, uh, data re-analyzed, and yet, and yet, you will still hear people talking about women use both sides of the brain and men use one side. So this is the beginning of slight alarm about how what the brain can do, um, or what we tell people the brain can do, actually um, can be misleading. The other thing to look at was still size matters. The idea that people were looking at, you know, used to think that because men had bigger brains, therefore they were superior. Now, neuroscience is looking in a much more subtle way at different structures. The idea that um, possibly... Sorry, go back with that one. Sorry, I'll show you that later. Um, the idea was that different structures of the brain, like the corpus callosum, bridge of, of nerves here, or the ratio of grey matter to white matter, particular types of, of nerve cells and their distribution, uh, parts of a hippocampus, all of these were originally measured as different. Now, we now know, with neuroscience techniques moving on, that actually what's really important is you just don't take the whole brain and measure it and say, oh, that's bigger than that, what a surprise. Um, in particular, because generally the structures people were looking at were bigger in men. So we go back to this old kind of 18th century idea that oh, men have got bigger hippocampus. They've got, you know, women have got a richer corpus callosum. But the trouble is, as we now found, and this is why I wanted to show you this slide, size matters. So the one clear difference between male and female brains is that male brains are bigger. On average, about 10% bigger. But that's because men on average, are about 10% bigger. Their hearts are bigger, their livers are bigger, their kidneys are bigger, etc. And we don't necessarily draw a huge amount of inference about liver function, kidney function, heart function, but we do with, with brains. And the key thing is, once you correct for the difference in brain size, all of these differences disappear. Uh, there's a paper just published at the beginning of this year saying this whole idea, big, big meta-analysis of studies showing that, in fact, um, there was no sexual dimorphism in the hippocampus. But again, these are the ideas that lodge themselves um, possibly in the public imagination, people writing books that capture the public imagination, even, as we shall see, scientists who should know better. So this was at the end of the 20th century. Um, so we're starting to see the brain re-emerging in much more subtle ways, um, but differences being used possibly um, in less subtle ways. Now, quickly then to the 21st century, these bright lights, I have to check, keep an eye on the time. Um, 
So women's place. Now, I'm going to go through these really quickly because they're probably statistics with which people are familiar. Where is women's place in the 20th century? Well, if you look at some of these statistics, not at the tables that count. There are gender gaps wherever you look. Um, I've chosen gender gaps in education, um, gender gaps in uh, the A-levels that uh, people choose to do. Um, the colour coding is to show that uh, almost all computing subjects are taken by, by males, right down to the uh, sociology subjects, um, most of, more of which are, are taken by females. Um, higher education, these are the kind of degree levels. Um, so at the bottom we've got uh, engineering, a uh, very small proportion of females here doing either undergraduate or postgraduate courses. Um, and similarly, if you look at the top, medicine, interesting, might want to talk about that later. But it's clear that there are big gender gaps. If you look at not necessarily universities, you look at um, this is uh, apprenticeships taken up um, in 2012, 2013. It's pretty clear what the gaps are there. You look at children's care and hairdressing, over 90% taken by females, engineering, construction skills, vehicle maintenance, IT and teleco telecoms, all taken by boys. And this, this relates to the, the STEM issue that we've talked about before. So clearly there's something still going on. There is a gender gap. Now, you don't need to say, are people still thinking, you know, is this something to do with the brain? Well, Okay, I think, and hopefully I'll get a chance to really run you through all of this this evening, there's some 21st century breakthroughs, which I think are really, really important. But in almost all cases, they're, sorry, this is also another example about the glass ceiling, um, where I think there's quite an interesting statistic here, fewer women leading FTSE uh, 100 firms than men called John, which is an interesting way of, of thinking of those kinds of statistics. Oh, and there is one other one, which again, if you think this is a, an important gap, uh, this is the distribution of male and female, current distribution of, of male and female MPs. So gender gap, what can neuroscience do about it? Well, I think there are three particular areas, and the first two is what I'm well, the first one is what I'm mainly going to be talking about, and the second two we will touch on at the end. We need some game changers to try and ad address these issues. Surely neuroscience, with all these wonderful techniques that I've, I've mentioned very briefly, can help. So first of all, the brain imaging breakthrough. I'll work through all of these three, but the brain imaging breakthroughs, I've shown you the kind of pictures. We have the technology. We have the ability to move on from the kind of old phrenology idea, we can look at millisecond, we can look at fun brain function in milliseconds, in millimeter sizes in the brain. So surely, with all of this wonderful technology, we could really have some insight into the answers. Now, neuroscience, the beginning of the 21st century, great for people like me, um, really popular. People think, you know, all sorts of... Neuroscience can explain everything, not just male-female differences, you know, important things like Bob Dylan's genius and, and, and who caused the banking collapse. Um, even used for um, marketing, so uh, neuro, you can get a whole range of neuro drinks, etc. So really, neuro is the new black. So with all of this interest, if you like, we should be able to solve some of these problems. These images have been described as having a seductive allure in that people are much more likely to believe them, you know, a slightly dodgy scientific arg argument if you've got a picture of a brain image, much more likely to believe than if you've just got a boring old graph. We'll come back to that, and there is an issue associated with that. But, so have, are we thinking about women differently? Do we really believe that we're still the victims of our own biology? Well, here's a rogues gallery, which suggests that perhaps there is still a bit of the old thinking going on. Um, Larry Summers, notoriously president of Harvard, said maybe there weren't very many women mathematicians because they didn't have the natural ability. Um, Nigel Short, uh, just last year, um, said that men were hardwired to be better chess players than women. Men and women do have different brains. This is a biological fact. I think uh, Nigel Short is as good a neuroscientist as I am a chess player. Um, Tim Hunt, well, perhaps we won't talk too much about Tim Hunt, just at the moment. Um, also, shockingly, we should give up encouraging girls to do science. This is somebody who claimed that uh, because of prenatal hormones, um, girls were predetermined to prefer people to things and therefore wouldn't be scientists just unpack the number of, you know, amazing assumptions in that particular statement. Okay, so 
People are still thinking in terms of hardwiring. They're still talking about biology. I'll go through this one very quickly. It's even in academia. This is idea of the raw innate ta talent. There was 30 different academic disciplines, um, and they asked uh, uh, proponents of these particular disciplines a whole range of questions. But what they were really interested in was, do these people believe that in order to succeed in your particular discipline, you have to be born to succeed? You have to be a, a born genius. And they generated this wonderful score, um, which was really to do with raw innate talent. Um, I think they gave it a scientific type title, field-specific ability beliefs. And they found a really interesting uh, fact. They, looked at, they then took these subjects and looked at the gender gap within these subjects. And they found that where the gender gap is biggest, i.e. where there's uh, fewest women, um, they had the most profound belief in raw innate ability. So what we're really saying here is that there is still this belief in the 21st century that there's some kind of biological imperative, which means that you're going to be a genius, and that biological imperative hasn't actually been granted to women. So we've got maths, engineering, computer science, physics, interestingly, philosophy and the social sciences here. So the philosophers also have a belief in this kind of genius aspect, which again is something you might like to come back to. So we've still got this argument about biology being destiny, that we've got our nice um, male line, which is going to become, as I say, a captain of industry, and we've still got... And this is in the light of our knowledge that actually at birth, there is no difference structurally between male and female brains. So we do have that biological evidence, but we still believe that things go differently. So at the end, you get this kind of brain here, which is a um, little princess brain, and dare I say it, might have a greater tendency to cry, okay? Right, so why are we at this stage? Well, we've got this wonderful neuroscience, but I think there's a problem. And what I'm really saying here is that there's two ways in which we can think about it, or two issues associated um, with uh, the ability that we have to do this amazing brain imaging. And I've called them neurotrash and neurosexism. So I'll just briefly go through um, what I mean by neurotrash um, and I hope there's nobody... Or I did actually give this talk and show this picture, and one of the authors was in the audience. And, um, I mean, I stand by the fact that it's neurotrash, but it did make the question and answer slightly interesting at the end. Um, OK, so neurotrash, briefly, this is the idea, this is what I call the popular books, the books, the, the, the neuroscience, fantastic, that everybody thinks neuroscience is wonderful. Double-edged sword is that there is a bit of misunderstanding about what we actually do. And that gets ignored by people who want to write popular books. I mean, good for them, but, you know, if they're these self-help books, they really need to know what they're talking about. And there's a bit of misunderstanding about what brain imaging can do. So if I had the wonderful images... Sorry. I have a problem with the fact that the light is on the same button as the, <laughs> the move on. OK, so these are the kind of data I can collect. And people say, oh, isn't that wonderful? That means that you can read my mind. You can look at that picture and know what I'm thinking. Or you can look at the fact that there's a particular part of the brain lights up and you know what that part of the brain is doing. Well, it would be nice to say that's true, but it is the case that brain images are not mind readers. We're not looking at things in real time. We're not what I call mind mappers. We don't say this little bit does language or this bit um, does emotion. We now know that the brain is hugely interconnected. The other thing that we need to put our hands up and confess, so that people who really believe that um, what they're looking at is a kind of real-time image, as though we're actually looking at the brain, and the phrase lighting up is used quite a lot. These kind of images, the ones that I've collected here, are, and I know personally to my cost, you can collect them very quickly, but the data analysis can take weeks, if not months. You have to go through it cleaning up the data, you have to match it to particular shapes of the brain, you have to filter it in particular ways, you have to set thresholds, then you have to colour code it in particular ways. So it tells a good story, which I can interpret because I knew what I was doing and I knew what the participants were doing and I knew how they behaved. But the people who write neurotrash or who take these wonderful images without really understanding them don't realise how much statistical manipulation is going on. And that's not in the sin sinister sense of the, of the word. It is just something that happens. And this is a story which some of you may be familiar with, but um, if you're not, then it actually tells the story quite nicely. There's a group of images, in order to illustrate what was going on, took a dead salmon, 
uh, put it in an MRI scanner, and it's an organic, uh, you know, although dead, there is organic matter that you can address with an MRI scanner. And they showed this dead salmon um, pictures of happy and sad faces. Okay. <laughs> They then, they then took the data, ran it through, obviously, slightly extended uh, manipulation, smoothing, filtering, etc. And they found at the end of it, there's a particular area here, I don't know if you can see, which you could say that bit lights up. So they found the bit of a dead salmon that responds differentially to happy and sad faces. <laughs> So this is known as the, uh, the dead salmon that launched a thousand skeptics. Unfortunately, not enough. But it, it is something which we really need to bear in mind. So next time you see a, you know, a Sunday paper with a wonderful brain image, you think, oh, that, you know, that's, not, that's not a real-time image. OK, so at the end of all of this, there are a whole range of books which I cheerily, even if the authors are in the audience, um, put under the heading of neurohype, neurobandwagons, neurobunk. They are the kind of, of books, um, particularly in this area, where um, people are saying, you know, why men don't listen and women can't read maps. They're looking at, they take brain imaging, brain imaging data, misinterpret it. Um, Luanne Brizendine, I'll come back to her, she is a real doozy when it comes to these sort of... Um, uh, Leon. <laughs> um, and a whole range of books all, you know, change your brain, change your life, uh, the God part of the brain. So it's fantastic as a newer image. You think well, people really think we can do fantastic things. But there is a downside to this, which I'll come back to. And this, of course, you know, a real bugbear, men are from Mars and women from Venus. I won't go into it in detail now, but the other aspect of this, as well as misusing the brain images that they, they misrepresent, is sometimes they're very careless. Um, and they use or misuse data, or they take a, something an abstract they read in a journal and they quote it and say, you know, this proves that men are different from women. Um, in uh, this particular book, as I say, one of my favourites, uh, she, she says that boys are less able to detect intonation in the adult human voice. So effectively, men aren't good at picking up, you know, not empathic. If you actually trace back the, refer the science that she's referring to, it's actually done on songbirds. So she's drawing amazing conclusions about males and females based on songbirds. Um, this is another book which talks about um, a tiny attention to detail and rapid reactivity of the male uh, perceptual system, uh, which means they're much better able to be um, eagle-eyed aviators, radar, uh, read radar, etc. Th that particular, again, traced back the science, was looking at uh, baby chicks pecking at corn. Um, and male baby chicks were quicker at picking up the corn um, than the female chicks. So that might tell you a bit about chicks, but it probably doesn't tell you much about aviators, or you would hope. So overall, um, I think this is something in terms of the kind of dustbin of, of history. We really need to look at these books very carefully for reasons that I will go into. The next stage is slightly more worrying for me as a scientist and, and for you, obviously, or with interest in science, is what we call neurosexism. And that's where the scientists themselves, for whatever reason, not necessarily um, deliberately misleading, are still kind of backward looking. They're still taking this assumption that men are different from women and they're looking for differences. We looked at the end of the 20th century Lots of publications about, you know, men having a bigger hippocampus, etc. Why are we still looking for differences? And this is a question that we'll probably need to come back to at the end. Now, this is a, a colleague of mine, Cordelia Fine, coined the term neurosexism. And she said, we'd really need to look at our own science and pick out some of the problems that are actually arising. Um, and these two examples here, um, both of which have been... Um, taken to task in the public domain, so I'm not hopefully um, setting the Royal Institution up for any kind of libel suit. This, is, this was something which was quite popular um, now two years ago now. Big Daily Mail headlines, at last the truth, men and women's brains are wired differently, um, you know, and if it comes from the Daily Mail, it must be true. Um, again, if you look at the science, uh, and this is what the authors said, taken together, these results reveal fundamental sex differences in the structural architecture of the human brain. And the scientists themselves claim that they found quite marked significant differences. Now, actually, the pathways they show are a tiny proportion of the pathways they measured. So the ones they're talking about um, are actually a tiny proportion. There was a huge number of pathways they measured which weren't significantly different. 
worth bearing in mind. The other thing, and this comes back to, I hope you've still got effect size in mind, um, is that this is the biggest effect size. So tiny, tiny differences, enough to be statistically significant, but do you think that's really meaningful? Do you think you can really say fundamental sex differences when these are the kind of differences you're looking at? I would say no, but the Daily Mail, why should, I mean, I don't know, maybe the Daily Mail does know about effect sizes and deliberately suppressing it, but I kind of suspect not. Um, I should probably get taken to task by the Daily Mail now, but anyway. Um, and this is another, another wiring paper where we hypothesized men's lower brain connectivity. They were talking about differences, which were of this order, um, might reflect optimization of functions that require specialized processing, such as spatial orienting. And then they're talking about women's greater connectivity in language. Now, apart from the fact that those images weren't really that different, the, the actual statistics, if you look at it, these authors didn't actually measure um, spatial cognition or language. They just took the stereotype that was out there and interpreted their data in those terms. And I think that's really important to realize that for whatever reason, scientists are perpetuating, sustaining these stereotypes. And of course, you know, why, this is something we could talk about at the end possibly, why, why are a scientist doing this? Okay, so at this point, we could say, stop there, I've said, oh God, look, you know, neurotrash, neurosexism, neuro, neuroimaging is fantastic, but look how it's being misused. But, um, still keeping just about to time, um, we, we really need to say, okay, we do have some fantastic things to share. We can do this properly, and that's really important. We can train people to understand what the difference between neurotrash and non-neurotrash. We can be careful about um, looking at neuroimaging publication. But a really other important breakthrough of my three game changes in the 21st century is this concept here, that brains are plastic and, slightly different version, brains are permeable. Now, this is something which is really good news, but it's also bad news, and it is of relevance to this particular topic. So, again, I won't go through this in detail because it's the kind of thing people are becoming familiar with. We used to think, if you, did, you, know, if you were trained in medicine 40 years ago, possibly, you'd be taught that you know, a child is born with the adult number of neurons, um, the brain grows because of the connections between the, the neurons and the pathways, um, grows through life, maybe there's a certain amount of damage or illness that you uh, affects the brain, but you don't get any more neurons. And then for those of us, uh, sadly, on the, you know, slightly on the wrong side of, of 50, or even more than slightly, actually, um, your gray cell, you, know, you fall off the, the, the cortical cliff, your gray cells disappear, you never get them back again, um, and you gradually or not so gradually, um, gracefully or not so gracefully, decline into senility. senility. That's actually not the case. We now know that our brains are plastic throughout our lives, and everything that happens to us changes our brain. Um, the examples originally given um, were in taxi drivers, people who'd done the knowledge in London, um, part of the brain that's important um, for spatial cognition, the hippocampus, is larger in taxi drivers. Um, also showed that, for example, Tetris, uh, the, the, the game with the kind of cascading cubes, um, that's a very complicated spatial cognition task. If you give a group of people um, quite intense training in Tetris over six weeks, um, their brains will change, and so will their spatial cognition abilities, interestingly. So things that you actually do, that you learn, and people will know about examples about musicians, etc. Um, also jugglers. Um, why juggling? Well, it's quite a complicated task. You can find quite a lot of people who don't know how to juggle um, and then train them to juggle and show how their brains have changed. So that's the good news, fantastic news. Brilliant for you know, people aging, people who've had some kind of damage, uh, people who believe in particular kinds of education, people who want to do something different with their lives. You're not fixed with your old sort of glass brain that's not going to shift at all. Your brain can change. So fantastic news. So why am I, why am I talking about it in terms of um, a kind of caveat uh, uh, warnings that I'm giving you this evening. Well, again, I did have some wonderful pictures uh, of, of, of very complicated science, but then I found this picture um, by a six-year-old uh, on, on the internet, um, and that says it all, actually. Everybody's brain is attached to the world. 
The key thing is that we're talking about here about experience-dependent plasticity. So everything, everything you experience changes your brain in a particular way throughout your life. Um, and it might shift back again. They've looked at retired taxi drivers, interestingly. Um, if you stop doing things, that will change your brain too. But supposing you don't have the experience. Supposing you're never given a Lego set. You never get practice with spatial cognition. Maybe, just maybe, and we'll come on to that later, that may affect how your brain works. And it's also crucially interesting that it's not just experiences. One of the things, and I'm going to talk about it very briefly, is its attitudes as well. We've shown that people's um, belief uh, in their you know, socioeconomic status, um, there, is, there is an association between your socioeconomic status and your brain. So different structures of your brain are slightly different depending on your socioeconomic status. Now, that could be, okay, health, uh, access to health, health, access to education, what kind of occupation you have. Now that we know the brain changes, all of that may be significant. But it's also the case that you're perceived socioeconomic status is associated with changes in your brain. So where you think you are in the pecking order also has an effect on your brain. Also, things like stereotype threat. Now, I won't go into a lot of details, and, and, and most of you will probably be familiar with the idea that if you take a, 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 particular, a member of a particular group um, and say, you know, you're asking them to carry out a particular task, and either overtly, you know, you're a lot of rubbish at this kind of thing. Or covertly, would you just tick the female box at the top of this uh, test score? You actually prime the person to think, oh, this is something which people like me find difficult. Unsurprisingly, very often the performance declines as, as, a, as an aspect of being exposed to stereotype threat. What we now know is it also changes the brain. And I'm going to show you that shortly, but the key thing to take from this message is that we're not looking at biology or society anymore. They're completely entangled. So it's really important that we understand what society can be doing to our brain, and similarly what that brain can be doing back to society, uh, in order to try and unpick this whole kind of gender gap issue. Right, now this is, uh, again, there are a lot of, work, uh, lot of studies looking at stereotype threat, but this is a particular particularly nice one. This was done by Mary Jane Raga um, about eight years ago. Um, the task was a mental rotation task. Take a 3D object, um, mentally rotate it in your mind and see if you can match it to one of, of four exemplars you're given. So it's a spatial cognition task. Um, what she actually did, she had three groups of women and we'll talk a bit about that afterwards. She gave one lot um, a neutral message, please, can you carry out this task? So they had this kind of standard instructions. She gave another lot the negative message. This is a mental rotation task. Uh, females do find it challenging, but, you know, never mind, I'm sure you'll do fine, dear. Um, <laughs> and the positive message was, actually, this is a perspective-taking task. So if you can imagine this particular object, if you can take a different perspective on it, Actually, women are rather good at that task. Um, off you go. So, obviously, I wouldn't be telling you this if, if, if we didn't have these kind of findings. The women who'd had the positive message made far fewer errors, significantly fewer errors, than the women who had the negative message. So, they performed the same task, but given a positive uh, context, they did better. Now, what was interesting was it also demonstrated differences in their brains. So the women who'd had the negative stereotype, there was much more activity in the brain here. Now, I've already said things like, you know, we can't pinpoint particular parts of the brain and say, it does this. But emotion regulation, we do know, is associated with that part of the brain. So there was much more activity in the, motor, in, in, in the emotion regulation aspect of the brain. Whereas the women who'd had the positive message, much more activity around the kind of spatial cognition network. So they kind of, they got on with the task and they got it right. Whereas the ones who'd had the, the negative message got it wrong and their brains were working differently. So I think that's, that's really important to bear in mind. So when we talk about brains being plastic, they're not just plastic, they're also uh, permeable. Now, I gave last week um, a talk to a group of occupational psychologists um, which was very much on this topic, but much more on plasticity. The trouble with girls, why plastic brains aren't, aren't breaking through glass ceilings. Um, and it was to do with the understanding that it's really important that we understand what plasticity means, good things, the good news and, and the bad news. Now, I'm, just before you start checking your train timetables, I'm not going to run you through that talk as well. Um, 
you can actually summarize it in quite complicated slide. Um, probably don't tell the people who had to sit through the whole hour last week, but um, <laughs> anyway. Okay, so we've got our predetermined pathways. Now, the assumption of all of this is that these um, developmental pathways, these tram lines, trajectories, whatever you call them, are taking part in a neutral environment. The environment is the same for everybody. Obviously, some people will have differences depending on where they grow up, but it's nothing to do with whether they're male or female. So the idea is, you know, obviously, unspoken assumption is that um, these brains are exposed to the same environment. And so any differences that emerge must be something to do with this kind of inbuilt biological trajectory. Well, now we know that brains are plastic and brains are permeable, we can quickly challenge that. Um, and as I say, here comes the complicated. Right from birth, okay, um, even before children are born uh, now, uh, you can know the, the sex of the child. Um, you can go to those card shops uh, where they're awash with, it's a boy, big blue card, or it's a girl. Um, you know, and you've got the pink and blue blanket aspect. So right from the very beginning, there's already an inbuilt differential tension um, in this, you know, for this developing brain. And I've highlighted toys here, the pink and the blue thing, the let toys be toys. A, because I think it's important, because it does already expose children uh, to differences. And it's interesting that actually the whole kind of pink-blue thing um, that, that figures, again, in, in, in neurotype discussions. Um, children don't show pink-blue preferences before they're about two. Now, there's a lot gone on in a two-year-old's life. So there's something else shifting that. I mean, if our visual systems aren't different, physiologically, there's no reason why we should respond differently to pink or blue. But people do. So there's something going on. And I think it's important to realize that. And the whole business about experience as well. If your toys are different, you don't get the right kind of experience. That's going to be significant. So you send off your little brain to, to primary school. Um, really interesting study last year, looking at 8,000 boys and girls. This was in Israel, where they have very rigorous testing at set times um, uh, throughout the school, um, the school system. But they also have teachers who give very similar sort of tests in class. So they had a big longitudinal data set looking at um, how the teachers mark the boys and the girls and what the boys and the girls actually got in their high school, in their um, tests throughout life. And they've generated this metric called a teacher bias, and it showed that, that uh, on a systematic basis, teachers overmarked boys compared with what they actually got in the, in the state examinations and undermarked girls. So they took this teacher bias and they looked at all the other factors which might have associated, affected these children. They wanted to know um, what, how they did uh, in their high school exams, what subjects they chose to do, because you can choose to specialize and do extra science, etc their own um, uh, estimation of their scientific ability and the subjects they then went on to do uh, in university. And they found, um, you know, taking account of all those factors, teacher bias, so what the teachers, how the teachers assessed them when they were in primary school was the most significant factor of all in determining those, those choices. So we're not, you know, the, level, the, the playing field is not level. And of course, you know, you've got uh, stereotypes like this. Children as young as Six pick up the idea of stereotypes. Um, children as young as nine are already behaving according to the stereotypes. So little girls will say they're not very good at maths, they won't do maths, even though their performance uh, is demonstrating that that's not the case. Um, adolescence, you know, huge things going on in the brain there, much more susceptible, very, very plastic, a time of huge plasticity, and a time when, you know, the world is awash with stereotypes. Um, this is quite an interesting finding, looking at if your brain is, is very well connected at particular times of adolescence, you have much higher resistance to peer influence. If it's not very well connected, you're not so resistant to peer influence. And of course, a lack of connection or changes in connectivity is, carrying, is, is occurring at adolescence. Um, and then, of course, you know, employment. Um, you get wonderful adverts like this. This was from the BIC company. Um, you know we, know, we know the world is stereotyped. I did actually find a nice one from Formula One yesterday. There was an article saying that women had no place in Formula One, although they did look good in white, like all other domestic appliances. Um, 
So, you know, obviously what I'm saying is that it's really important to realize that the world, um, there's not a level playing field for these little developing brains. Um, and what's important is that that playing field, all those differences, will in fact um, change the brain in quite particular ways. And I think that's really important to realize and something that we should grasp onto. Okay, so now to the final um, game changer. And this is something which has actually been in the ether for some time, and there was a paper just before Christmas. And this whole idea, which is you know, a bit startling, sex redefined. Have we been wrong about sex all along? You know, that would really have packed, packed the hall this evening. You know, let's, you know, let's talk about sex and the fact that we've been wrong about it all along. Okay, there was a paper in Nature a couple of years ago, fantastic biologist, sex redefined. The idea of two sexes is simplistic. Biologists now think there's a wider spectrum than that. And that was based on uh, looking at chromosomes in individuals, looking at um, particular reproductive organs in individuals, or, or vestiges of, of reproductive or, um, organs in individuals, looking at chromosomes, different cells in the same individuals, and finding it's not this nice little category differences that we've always assumed. This is, this is the basis of everything we talk about. Men are different from women. Of course they are. Well, actually, maybe they're not. Um, and this is, of course, something which people find quite challenging, um, perhaps for obvious reasons. Right, so hopefully you remember this. This is a quick uh, reminder of what we saw at the beginning, effect size. So it's really important that we remember that um, all of the differences we've been talking about are actually tiny, so maybe talking about redefining sex is a very good idea. Now, I'll just summarise this quite briefly, because in fact, cognitive neuroscientists, like me, have been saying this for a long time. Before the biologists, we've been saying, do you know what? If you look at the kind of things you claim are different, are fixed because of biology, and then you look at them over time, you won't be able to see this scale, but it's actually looking at achievement in particular cognitive scores um, of individuals who were born in the 1920s right up to 1950s, and showing that the scores are improving um, associated with improvements in access to education um, in both sexes. But saying, if these are biological and fixed, how can they change over time? How can they be different in different cultures? That's really important. So disappearing differences is a, is a useful mantra. Similarities, not differences. Janet Hyde did a wonderful study, two meta-analyses, of looking at all the kind of things that, that we might be interested in, looking at cognition, um, at social skills, at personality skills, and saying that really we should be talking about similarities. The differences within groups of men and women are much greater than the differences between them. So she was saying, let's talk about gender similarities and, and really uh, acknowledge the fact that in all the studies we look at, um, the effect size is tiny. Finally, there was a lovely uh, couple of studies, a uh, wonderful title, Black and White or Shades of Grey. Somebody's saying, statistically, this whole categorical issue doesn't make any sense. Let's take all of these measures which supposedly differentiate men and women. 122 different measures they took, um, something like 13,000 individuals when they collected together all the, all the data from different studies. It was a whole range of everything, masculinity and femininity, a whole range of different skills which everybody knew differentiated men from women. And they said, if you run it through a different statistical procedure, you're actually looking at dimensions. You shouldn't be looking at all males are like this and all females are like this. You've got a single dimension, and you'll find males and females are distributed along this, this dimension pretty evenly. The only extremes um, you'll probably be interested to know, um, uh, there was virtually no... The, the, the biggest difference, male, male difference, was watching porn. No women watching porn. Wearing makeup at the other end. Um, I have had somebody in a talk like this stand up and say, do you know there is no known example of women stealing men's underwear off washing lines? <laughs> so <laughs> I, I don't know if that actually got measured, but you know, you kind of think <laughs> with enemies like that, who needs friends? Um, now, most recently, just before Christmas, this was the paper which came out, which was very exciting, I, I thought, wrote about it in The New Scientist. Um, again, I won't go into it in detail, but this was somebody who took um, 1,400 different brains, data on 1,400 different brains, actually looked at 
300, over 300 different areas in the brains and actually rated them according to whether they were characteristic of all the male participants or characteristic of all the female participants or whether they were somewhere in between. And effectively, what, what she found was that um, we're really looking at a mosaic. If you look at tiny little differences within the brain, cellular structures, then actually there's no one area which is really characteristic. You say, that is a male brain. Or, or part of a male brain, or that is part of a female brain. So as well as our behaviours, our brains are mosaics. So actually, we should probably stop thinking about males versus females, and great breakthrough, focus on individual differences. So that would be really fantastic if we, if we could do that. So I think that's probably the strongest shift in thinking that we need, that neuroscience needs to support. I have to say, having written something um, in The Neuroscientist, um, as you can imagine, somebody like me stands up and gives talks and says men aren't different from women. Um, you can imagine the kind of trolling I get. Um, very interesting little JPEGs get sent to me to demonstrate that men are different from women. <laughs> and we're not talking brains here. Um, very small JPEGs, of course. Um, <laughs> But the worst trolling I got was having supported this particular study. So it's something which is very ingrained and very inbuilt in people, and you know, at the basis of all sorts of prejudice. It's something which people feel really challenged by. Um, it's something that neuroscience could address, but as we've seen, there's, you know, it's a double-edged sword. So hopefully all of you today um, will realize you know, what the double-edged sword is like and, and, and be primed. So there is a little bit of... Um, these are the things I'd, I'd, I'd like people to take away and remember. Um, brain imaging breakthroughs. Beware neuro nonsense. Be careful about neuro trash and, and, and neuro sexism. Really, you know, next time you look at, um, you know, men are from something or women are from somewhere else, you know, have a check about the neuroscience. The rightly seductive allure of neuroscience. It's fantastic. We really can address issues properly if we're not hidebound by these old ideas, old ideas of always looking for differences. Plastic brains and permeable brains, the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that our brains are plastic and they can change and they can recover and they don't need to get old as quickly as, 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 they, as we thought. The bad is that if we're exposing people to the wrong kind of experiences or, the, or no experiences at all, this is gonna change, this is gonna change their brains. And we're wrapped in a, a cycle of self-fulfilling prophecy and it's really important that we realize that. And the ugly is where people just will ignore those differences and, and, and just persist in the idea of, of hard wiring. Um, and sex redefined men and women are both from Earth. I mean, I think that, that probably says it all. So let's get rid of the, the Mars and Venus hokum. So some of you may be interested in direct action. Um, I did give a talk at the Women in the World Festival and we, we decided that we needed some kind of direct action. So we were going to issue some stickers so that when you went on to um, um, bookshops, you might uh, see this particular book and you could stick something like that on it. <laughs> and next time you see the Daily Mail, you know they always have those comments. If they have something like this, then you want to actually say to them, just how big is your effect size? <laughs> okay, that's me. Any questions? <laughs> Because there is this publication bias. You know, you, why, why are people still asking these questions? It's something that's going to get published. If you find a difference, it's more likely to get published than if you don't.